Well, Natalie's going to talk about injustices. She's had lots of experience, experiences where she could observe them working as a lawyer, the president of the Law Commission of Canada, the Dean of Civil Law and later of Common Law at the University of Ottawa, the General Counsel for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, a member of the government, the provincial government, um, Catherine Wynne's government, where she was an MPP and then Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, and then a backbencher at the beginning of the Ford government. And that brings her to her current position as principal of Massey College. She's excelled at the law and its application to society, and that's reflected in having received the Order of Canada, the Order of Ontario, several honorary degrees, and being a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So we very much look forward to hearing about injustices today and hopefully a little bit about what can be done about them. Over to you, Natalie. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful group of uh, colleagues. I'm looking forward to the discussion and, and particularly feel free to interrupt me at, at any time. It's, uh, so I've prepared some, some remarks on uh, that, uh, uh, that I think uh, will be there to summarize a little bit what I want to do with you today. So the title, No Shortage of uh, Injustices, is really a, a title that I used when I was at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. I wrote a short piece at the end, and that summarized very much my impression at, uh, at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. And I could have used the same title at the end of my three years in politics. I want to today, and I think that's a title that uh, will be quite applicable to the two major ideas that I have for you today. The first one discussing a little bit the paradoxes of uh, fighting for civil liberties in an unequal world. And secondly, the way in which the advocacy sector is organized in Canada. And both titles, the title of No Shortage of Injustices, would be applicable to my two parts. I'd like to start with the story. When about a year after I began at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, we decided to uh, engage into developing a monitoring program for the G20 that was going to take place in Toronto. That's 10 years ago. And you will recall that they were mass arrest. Two of our neutral monitors were arrested and sent to detention. And two others were also arrested in the kettling exercises that were prevalent throughout the weekend. Because I was the, the executive director and the general counsel, as a, as a good leader, I decided to take a shift in this volunteering exercise. And so I took one, uh, grabbed a, our, our bag of monitors and went down Avenue Road on the Thursday before. It's a, it was a, a beautiful day. It was was a sunny day and they were indeed uh, way more police officers than protesters on the Thursday before. They had been protests to, throughout the week in Toronto uh, and but the bulk of them would take place during the weekend. So this is what I wrote uh, that day. Walking down uh, Avenue Road, more police than protest. Uh, I'm about at the corner of uh, Dundas and Avenue uh, see uh, police officers following a group of uh, young people. They're a bit far from me. We'll have to get closer. Uh, police officers uh, arrest them, uh, ask uh, them to open their bags. Uh, surprise because they were really nothing, they were doing nothing wrong, no protest sign, no nothing. Uh, they uh, focus on one of the four. Uh, opens his um, 
uh, backpack, unable to see whether there was consent obtained, unable to see the badges of the police officer. This would turn out to be quite a problem throughout the, 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 the G20 uh, that some police officers had removed their badges. Um, backpack is being opened uh, and spread on the, on the street. Nothing in it, police officers uh, leave. Note to self and note to team. The only person in the group and the one whose backpack was picked was the only black person in the group. And this I think was prescient of what we saw this summer, but I think it reflected, I remember at that time writing to myself that night that how disgusted I was. What was disgusting about it was a little bit almost the normal way it happened and the way in which this racism was being sort of played out in the open without any sort of accountability or sense of, of wrongness about it. We would, uh, the CCLA would indeed uh, participate very much in the effort to curb the carding practices and we would continue to be big advocates on many law reform initiatives that emerge from the experiences of the G20. Some of them, if we have occasion, I can talk about. But I think uh, the experience of witnessing that uh, display of racism uh, was back in my mind uh, last summer. Uh, certainly, I think we all saw it, we witnessed it, we heard, I can't breathe, and we saw the level of police brutality and racism in existence. It has brought a, a real sense of discomfort about why is it that we continue to have so much trouble achieving quality. And I think it throughout the summer and the last six months have been involved in different projects about imagining, reimagining what is it? Why is it that we are have so much trouble uh, realizing the promise of equality? Indeed, our democracy demands a commitment to abstract principles, the presumption of innocence, uh, freedom of speech, Nevertheless, when there's such a gap between the promises in the written document and the reality on the ground, it becomes almost untenable. So I think some of the debates about free expression is really about a way of assessing this gap between the reality and the promises in our constitutional document, in our international uh, 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 commitment as well. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the big divide. And in my view, I've come to the conclusion that one of the, the big issue that needs to be confronted here is that we're very early on, we made a difference between socioeconomic rights and civil and political rights. Socioeconomic rights were going to be aspirational and civil and political rights were going to be at the core of democratic societies. And I think that divide brings us to a place where we see too much of a gap between uh, the, the rights of the rich and the rights of the poor. And that divide ensures that uh, even the civil and political rights are now being challenged and are unworkable unless they can operate in a climate of equality. So. Um, if speech is not free, if it speech is not free, if it is unequal, and it is indeed a limitation, a profound limitation. And I want to talk a little bit about the way in which what I call the paradoxes of civil liberties. So in my view, the current debate over free speech is a little bit narrow. It opposes sometimes freedom versus equality as though uh, in the French way, when you said liberté, égalité, fraternité, you need all three. And if you uh, put freedom ahead of equality, as I would suggest, our predisposition to protect civil and political rights versus putting socioeconomic rights as aspirational, as put it in this 
format where we are undermining the essence of free speech because we are accepting that it can be unequal. So in one corner, free speech supporters maintain the right to say whatever they believe without any consequences, a right without responsibility. And in the other corner, you have the those who claim that uh, a right to break the silence, a right for inclusivity in discourse, that there should be greater limits on free speech, and that this the debate is framed in this opposition. So in my view, I think uh, the gap between these abstract principles of rule of law, presumption of innocence, uh, the importance of the free ex 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 exchange of ideas, the free market of ideas, equality before the law, all of these principles uh, and the gap between this really test ultimately our commitment to the very existence. Um, when a black man gets shot seven times in the back while being arrested, it's very difficult to continue to believe in the right to the presumption of innocence. You cannot be presumed innocent if, if you're dead. And your right to trial is not going to matter if you're dead. So violent responses to speech such as are happening everywhere else frighten. Uh, Certainly, I think there are terrorism and there's criminal. Nevertheless, I think it continues to be a mistake if we remain in this binary opposition uh, between pro-freedom of speech and pro-limitation of speech. As I said, liberté, égalité, fraternité, this is not a multiple choice question. <laughs> it's a cumulative proposition. We need all three. Because if we have freedom without equality, we limit the essence of the good life and self-fulfillment to very, the very few, and that's inappropriate. Freedom without equality limits, leads to the freedom of the very few uh, and everybody else uh, being there having to listen. And we have to challenge the ones who hold the mic more often, particularly if they hold the mic without any accountability. So the value of free speech and I can may be undelivered if we continue to have speech that is limited to an, a certain number of people. Because inequality not only limits speech, but also it imposes silence. But at the same time, equality without liberty is not much better. Uh, it presents, it has the danger of presenting current ideas are as orthodoxies, it can stifle the evolution and can lead to uh, inability of new thinking to even challenge the current claims. So every movement from change, and I've been part of many, struggles often with the demand for loyalty and the allegiance to the fight. I remember the early days of the feminism, the second wave of feminists, where there was deep contestation within the movement by black feminists uh, over the predominance of white women holding the mic. And socialist feminists were challenging as well the absence of discussion about poverty. And the LGBTQ were, uh, plus were also arguing about many of the hetero assumptions in the feminist movement. All these voices were really important to move the movement in new directions. So it's all, always is important to preserve freedom and liberty so that you actually get better equality, more challenging, uh, more challenges to the very idea of what you're trying to put. So I think challenges among equality groups is not without pain, <laughs> but it needs to happen. And so therefore for me, equality without liberty uh, represses the very idea of change and evolution and therefore it's a short term uh, it does deny the ability of progress over time and i believe that uh, it's about time uh, to talk about fraternité or solidarity and i think it's it's very interesting i remember there was one of my colleagues who's now a court of appeal judge who used to say liberty is this 19th century idea uh, we know a lot about it because it's a 19th century idea. We know a little bit about equality, mostly a 20th century, uh, 20th century aspiration. And we know absolutely nothing about solidarity. And he wanted to make it 
the promise of the 21st century. I really like that uh, way of thinking about this. In my view, I think uh, our intellectual heritage that has been obsessed with preserving civil and political rights and as regarded socioeconomic rights as only aspirational has denied the ability of solidarity to be fully fledged and to be to become an important aspect of our of our search for justice. So uh, if we continue to to posit uh, free speech as the most important right and put equality second, I think we're heading in the wrong direction. It's not uh, solidarity is not a nice to have right, it should be essential to get. So let me talk a little bit then uh, now that uh, I've talked a little bit about that big paradox, uh, and I hope that these uh, ideas were challenging a little bit and hope to, uh, to get some, some feedback on it. Let me talk now about how do you advocate and just a couple of things about the mechanics of being in that advocacy sector and the way in which uh, uh, we organized ourselves at the CCLA. And on this part, I think I will be a little bit uh, uh, more candid about the way in which the the, the advocacy center is being organized. So I use the phrase, there's enough injustice for everyone several times where I was at the CCLA and uh, in other uh, groups of advocacy, because there is inherent competition between advocacy groups. You know, we all are competing for uh, attention from the press. We all are competing for the same dollars, uh, particularly if you're at the CCLA, the, the dollars to uh, advocate for free speech of annoying and difficult people is there are limited constituencies that you can go after. So we compete and, and uh, uh, there is in a way a, a lack of organization of the sector, whereas for big fights to have success, like for example, uh, the right to uh, the marriage, uh, the same sex marriage, you need organization, you need coordination. So how to develop this sort of uh, ability to bring the sector together to fight on certain priorities, organize your cases, organize also the, the way in which that you will push on the legislative side as well. So you need to have both and you need to be in a position to organize yourself to be effective at both levels as well as um, speaking, I would describe to the indifferent, you know, continuing to do uh, general education. We used to talk about this, you know, you speak to the powerful, you speak to the powerless, so they don't internalize injustice and don't internalize their, their inequality and start seeing themselves as not real citizen. You know, there's a profound loss of ability to argue if people start believing and abandoning the idea that they deserve justice. So you have to speak to them, you have to value them, you have to support their voices, you have to allow for a good organization to take place. But then you have to also, I think, uh, speak to the indifferent who are the people that uh, see the world pass by uh, and never feel a concern to fight for, for injustice. So anyway, um, the way in which to organize, I think it requires uh, a lot more uh, um, skill set within the advocacy sector. Uh, we tried to do a few things about this, and I think that the universities can help uh, bring about a, a, set, a certain level of skill set about coordination, about uh, organizing good conferences where people can see that they will uh, they're heading in the same directions. They will always be the outlier, but the, the sense in which the sector has to become a little bit uh, more organized, uh, particularly on the equality side, is starting to be felt. I am a big supporter of the uh, program to uh, give some funding for litigation. I think uh, it does help provide that ability to coordinate as well, because uh, it does create a, a way in which to apply for funding, you need to create a team. So it's a little bit like when Shirk tells you that you need to have more university being on the same grant, they start talking to each other as opposed to always be competing. And that's the same, it has the same impact on the organization 
of the advocacy sector. Where do I see it going in the future? I think the what there will be big challenges in terms of uh, the sector breaking apart in different groups that uh, will be advocating for their own uh, identity sector. So that will occur, that will continue to occur. But the, the organizations that are about principle, you know, Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the BC Civil Liberties Association, and others must continue to aim for um, bringing people together and advocating in a more concerted way. And I think the Asper Center for Constitutional Law, for example, at UFT does a good job of doing that, uh, trying to uh, uh, be at the forefront and of not taking the place of others, not replacing the voice of others, but supporting a, a good advocacy in the sector. Uh, just to conclude, the range of, of um, law reform proposal that came out of the GTA was huge. And I think many of them uh, have been implemented. Certainly, I think there's been a ban on the technique of kettling. Just so you know what it is, kettling was when the police force would surround a group of protesters or no protesters, whatever, and pressure put forwards. And then eventually, uh, I can tell you it's people panic in the middle. And then they create one, just one uh, way for people to leave that circle of police officers and they arrest people as they leave. Um, this has had the impact of detaining people that were walking by, that were caught uh, without even wanting to be in, in a protest, and was extremely, it, it, I think we were able to advocate and demonstrate that this was unconstitutional, and we know that the Toronto Police has abandoned it. There is an entire regulations of the tools that can be organized, that can be displayed and used against protesters that need to be done. We were involved in litigation to try to uh, define that the sonic cannon was a weapon uh, and needed to be uh, approved before being uh, used against people. And part of it, I think, was because it could be uh, used to elicit some pressure and it had some health issues with the, uh, for, for the people subject to it. But this entire area is a real mess. Um, there's very little regulations. Police uh, just buy whatever's on the market and it's often too late by the time uh, uh, people can regulate whether or not it's the right tool to be deployed and what are the, the and we know that uh, there's a large industry that is building more and more of these tools <laughs> uh, around the world. And part of speaking to our colleagues around uh, different nations, we know that uh, there's no shortage of imagination in terms of how the new uh, tools that uh, need to that are bought and constructed and built and used against protesters. And finally, I think. For me, uh, agent provocateur, uh, the use of agent provocateur, I put forward the proposition that they should be regulated as well. They should be a warrant <laughs> or they should be a supervision by a judicial authority before the use of this technique. It has uh, too much potential for exploitation of innocent people. And so that's another aspect of, of uh, the law reform initiatives that come out of having lived through the weekend of the G20. And I, I, I am a bit sorry that I focused on that, but the last, for the last year, week, I was reminded of several incidents at the, the G20. So it was fresh on my mind and I've been dreaming about it. So I thought I would share with you <laughs> a little bit of my reflection 10 years later. So uh, let me stop here and, and uh, respond to questions and have a discussion.